See ten participants. There we go. Hey, we're coming around. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I see people coming on. We're getting our attendees, so please bear with us as everybody logs on. Okay. So we have 50 people. Looks like yeah, we that's are. correct. Okay. I think we so can go ahead, Ron. Great, great. So I know a lot of people are on mute currently right now, so I just want to share a quick welcome to everybody uh, and welcome back to the webinar series that um, we used to do. Um, we felt as though that this is a great opportunity to A, kick it off, and B, just be leaders in the industry and help our team and help the people that are in our group uh, support everybody with as much knowledge on this, uh, this crazy thing that's going on in our world today. So I want to thank everybody for joining and, and, and being part of this, and certainly this is one of the things that, that we really value, the relationship and the family atmosphere inside of, um, inside of SHFM. So what I'd like to do first and foremost is I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Melvin Kramer. Uh, first and foremost, I've known Dr. Kramer for about 20 years, and I would also share that it's somebody that I have a lot of respect for that has helped me out through a lot of tough times and, and many of these instances where I've needed his help and support. Uh, I jokingly sometimes call uh, Dr. Kramer my consigliere on safety and sanitation. Um, and I'd also like to tell everybody that I also call Dr. Kramer a friend. So to go a little bit deeper into this, I'll share Dr. Kramer. He's an environmental and infectious disease epidemiologist with over 40 years of professional experience in all aspects of infectious disease, especially with and for the food industry, both as a regulator and a consultant. He has consulted widely on food processors, manufacturers, growers, importers, exporters, the cruise industry, as well as having served as an expert in matters relating to the regulation of food and an expert witness in litigation, mostly in areas of foodborne illness and foodborne disease, outbreaks, and recalls. 
He's the author of journal publications on food safety and infectious disease topics, and he's lectured at, the col at colleges, universities, and conferences, as well as internationally representing the United States on matters of BSE like mad cow disease, primarily in Asia, where our beef was not being accepted, as well as lectured on other topics such as bloodborne disease, as well as respiratory disease such as avian flu and influenza. When Dr. Kramer had come to me and, and offered the opportunity to speak, I jumped at it. I thought this was a great opportunity for him to get in front of all the people um, and a kind of share a little bit of what's going on that you know that may or may not be just in the news that we can have those discussions, and then more importantly, so we can have Q and A, so everybody can open up discussions. Um, so we are allowing most of our time for today for Q and A, and we encourage you to submit your questions to Dr. Kramer. In order to submit a question, please use the Q&A window at the bottom below of your Zoom screen. All questions will be received through the Q&A window, and uh, Tony Butler will be handling that from his end and reading them, um, reading them aloud. So without further ado, I would like to just say um, a quick mention of the fact that, that we are dedicating this webinar series to one of our, our past members, Ira Kaplan. Uh, Ira had been a longtime moderator in these webinar series, so this is, um, you know, while these discussions are so topical, I just do want to make sure that we, we recognize and mention the past, and, and a great thanks to Ira, and, and that's certainly somebody that we miss in the industry. So again, without further ado, I would like to just introduce Dr. Melvin Kramer and thank him for his time taking out of the day to spend some time with us as our SHFM family. Dr. Kramer, please have at it. Thank you, Rob. Um, I also would like to add one other thing. I am a very proud member of the organization as well and have been and actually have lectured at one or more um, uh, of your annual meetings. Good afternoon, everyone. I want you to all know that we are in a bit of a rough time. However, the roughest part of it is anxiety, uh, the, the sky is falling. We're not going to get through this. These types of fears are just overwhelming, and it's very difficult to separate fact from fiction unless you really know the facts. This is not a superbug. This is a bug that has come on the scene. We've had coronaviruses for decades that we've been studying it, they change. The biggest change mutation started with SARS. You all remember SARS. Uh, and then uh, that went away. When did it go away? It went away in June, July. And we were spared in the United States significantly. Then in the Middle East, especially in the Arabian Peninsula, they have another coronavirus called MERS. And what's interesting is these coronaviruses circulate widely among the animals. And then they sometimes cross over, and that's when the trouble starts. Uh, SARS basically was a civet, which is kind of like a cat that was in China. Um, MERS is a camel, and we believe uh, COVID-19 COVID came from a bat at one of these um, markets in China. For those of you who have been to China and who like to go to markets like I do, it's, uh, it's a menagerie, but it's fascinating because it gives you an opportunity to see what the true culture of uh, some of these cities are. And um, I totally have seen things that I never thought I'd ever see um, in terms of marketing for human food consumption. But that is, that is where some of these bugs have become uh, implanted. And then from this implantation, into these more domesticated, if you can use that word, animals, then into people, and then it started to spread. I think that the one thing that we all should have zero tolerance for is any type of xenophobia, pushing it to 
It's a foreign virus. It came from here. It came from there. It's a bug. The bug is the enemy, and we will conquer the bug through testing, understanding what, what, what people have and don't have. Hopefully, we're going to have the development of a vaccine. And more promising is there are some antiviral medications that have uh, been on uh, research. They failed for uh, Ebola, but there is promise for uh, COVID-19. And uh, the Chinese are being extraordinarily helpful in allowing us to do basically phase three, one, two, and three testing. And if successful, we may uh, see that um, uh, get, get, get some type of additional approval. Um, as a side note, the FDA cares much more about safety than they do about efficacy. Of course, we would all like it to be both safe and efficacious. So as a food service executive operator responsible for all of these um, individuals who frequent your uh, establishments, whether they're your employees, guests, um, just people who, who, who come in, this is a potential problem that needs to be understood. I have a slide uh, looking at uh, some of the facts. The, uh, uh, it, it was updated today, but not probably good enough because every five minutes there's a change. New countries are being added. Um, and the number that I'm looking at more than anything else is I'm looking at the case fatality ratio or the mortality rate um, in the United States. I believe, and I just, you gotta strap in and, 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 and be ready for this ride. Once we get the promised million, two million, three million test kits deployed and easily um, uh, accessible, you're gonna see a incredible increase in the epi curve of cases, but with that increase, we're gonna find more cases, but I think you're going to find that our case fatality rate is going to be lower. South Korea, that has been an absolute model in this, they are doing 10,000 tests a day. They're doing drive-in through tests, which by the way, I believe the state of Washington is, is prepared to do, and I think uh, Governor Cuomo in New York uh, wants to potentially do that uh, as well. It was, it was just sheer brilliance. Um, their case fatality rate is about seven tenths of 1%. So I think that if we look at China at 2% worldwide, according to the WHO at 3.4%, South Korea at seven tenths of 1%, um, I am very hopeful that we will be closer to South Korea or even lower than, than that. We have a confounding variable in that this is typical influenza season. Since October, we've had over 12,000 people who have died from seasonal influenza and complications thereof. And I am not 100% sure, and neither is anyone else, that some of these people may um, have had coronavirus and not influenza, or they had both. Can we have the next slide, please? I do. Thank you. The coronavirus is a large family of viruses that cause the common cold. So all of us have had some um, uh, exposure to it. And one question that I'm frequently asked is, why aren't children getting sick, thankfully? And one potential explanation is that they, with all of their, especially the kids in daycare and preschool and school, they're constantly passing these bugs back and forth, and there might be enough with their immune system to have enough cross-reactivity to give them some degree of immunity or just a very slight runny nose or, um, or, or, or minor uh, cough having nothing to do with what we're really looking for. They're not, we're not seeing severe um, 
a disease in children, which is really good. We look at the high-risk people, the people who uh, have uh, died have been in their 70s and 80s. The worst example, which just is, 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 is so unacceptable, is what has gone on in, in Washington State with that nursing home. And I think we all have to salute the uh, workers who stayed on the job, became infected, and actually took care of these uh, individuals. Of course, I would have liked the state of Washington National Guard to have deployed uh, either medical people or the state health department to have gone in and taken over the facility. But again, I'm not the governor, and uh, nobody asked me what my uh, opinion really is. But the interesting part of the coronavirus is that we do see that it can survive on surfaces. Now, a few hours to several days, why don't we know the true answer? We need more research. However, that's why surface cleaning becomes so critical, and what you clean with also is critical. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a website uh, that is an EPA website that actually has what is listed that is acceptable for elimination of this virus. A lot of sanitizers and disinfectants you already have. Unfortunately, there has been reported shortages by some manufacturers uh, as well as at retail uh, levels. Next slide, please. The basic method of spreading this disease is through droplet infection. That is the route of infection that we have uh, primarily. Secondly, when a person touches a contaminated surface, we call them fomites, and then you rub your eyes, rub your nose, get into a mucous membrane, that too is a way that we can spread. If you wear glasses, you're very good off from your conjunctiva. Um, we do not believe that people who are well should be running around with masks. Masks are not as effective as people think they are, especially the little paper masks. If you really want a mask, you should get an N95, and the ones that are used in healthcare actually have a, a moisture barrier um, because they obviously are being more assaulted with um, respiratory secretions and other secretions. There is zero evidence, and I want to emphasize it as many times as necessary, that this can be transmitted through food. This is not a foodborne disease. People say, well, some people do get diarrhea from it. Well, people get diarrhea from lots of things that have nothing to do with, 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 with food. However, there is zero evidence that this is a foodborne disease. However, the fomites, the inanimate surfaces which the virus can settle on and can be transplanted by hand to the mucous membranes in any environment, in the elevator, in the food service environment, on the escalator, uh, in the subway, uh, the valet comes with your car and stays in his hand or her hand and touched your steering wheel, and then you go into your eyes or mouth or grab something to eat, that's, that's where we seem to have the problem. And that's the intervention that we're trying to talk about, hand-washing, 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 and the utilization of um, alcohol-based uh, sanitizers. And when we talk about hand washing, I'm sure everyone is sick and tired of hearing that you have to have good rubbing in between the fingers, having the nails in your palms, sing happy birthday twice, they say 20 seconds, um, however you want to do it, do it, and then use a clean um, uh, disposable towel. Then the question becomes, well, then I open the door of the bathroom 
what do I do? Well, I'm going to tell you the public health service on cruise ships requires them to have something to pull the door open uh, and then another bin to take that um, uh, those uh, napkins or paper towels or whatever. I personally, and don't think bad of me, if there is none, I throw it on the floor. That's what I do. That's why I like seeing baskets there, because it's very important that we don't cross-contaminate. And also, when we turn the faucets off, a faucet, we should use a paper towel um, after we're done drying our, our hands to get another one to open, open uh, the door. This is a little bit more than most people do um, during, during the, uh, the course of their normal habit. Secondarily, remember, your cell phones are probably dirtier than some bathrooms. Use a, um, one of these wipes. Uh, whether they're Lysol wipes or Clorox wipes or Oxivir wipes or any other brand that is listed by the EPA, that's important uh, to make sure that those that go close to your eyes, close to your nose, you get your hands and you touch your face, that's something that's very, very important. Next slide, please. When we go and look at the retail environment, transmission when you have people is impossible. Customer to customer, worker to worker, worker to customer, customer to worker, it doesn't matter. We're in this together. What we want to make sure is that we have protocols to make sure that we reduce the probability. And I'll tell you, as someone who has testified in court, I'll testify under oath that anything's possible. I have to deal in probability. Let's reduce the probability. This website is a very good website by the EPA on what is um, uh, what are the sanitizers, the disinfectants that can be used. I am concerned about service utensils. How often are we, are we uh, changing them out? Uh, do you want to go to more of a grab and go? Do you want to have somebody serving like a, at a salad bar? Because remember, if I wash my hands before I eat, then I come in, I use all of these multi-use um, uh, ladles and spoons and, and tongues, and then I fumble and dumble to get my credit card or my cash or my badge. And then I go, my hand washing that I did before is almost useless. And then I start rubbing my eyes and rubbing my face. And we, we touch our face about 20 times uh, uh, an hour, I think, is the statistic that I saw. Um, I tried to be conscious to see if I could count myself, and I got lost. Um, you're always counseling people, you're always training people, you're always reinforcing good habits. Again, let's try to encourage and reinforce hand washing. Um, hand sanitizer is good, but it's not as good as hand washing. And I think that is so important and up the game on food handler training. Whether it's task oriented or pre-meal or just any time you can have an opportunity to make this in, an important piece. And as executives who walk through the kitchen, please, the first thing that you do, what I do, very visibly, almost making a production, where's the nearest hand washing sink? And I let people like look at me while I'm washing my hands. And I've instructed my staff to be a little bit more flamboyant in making sure that they, too, when they're in a unit, they are leading by example. Your policies regarding illnesses have got to be enforced voluntarily. If you're sick, please don't come in and tell me you're sick. Call. What are your sick leave policies? What are you going to do about people who are um, quarantined? That's an individual corporate decision. 
I've heard everything from we're going to pay them to stay away to they'll use their um, PTO uh, to I'm sorry, we haven't figured it out yet. I think it's time to start figuring these things out. Next slide, please. We have in our practice two uh, companies that actually have had confirmed cases. So we've developed a protocol guidance, which I call a best practice. Uh, they were both, by the way, in New York City. Uh, and I had, after being frustrated with the, with the uh, operations people, I finally got to speak with someone at the vice, uh, at the assistant uh, commissioner level. And I ran our policy by him, and by and large, he liked it. I gave him a copy of it, uh, which, by the way, is posted on our website at ehagroup.com. Uh, and um, I said, look, if the city wants to take it, take it. I mean, I don't believe that uh, uh, public health has any type of um, – uh, we, we, we don't have competitive advantages or disadvantages. The ill person has got to be excluded from the work environment until cleared by a doc to return to work. Individuals who are working close or have worked close to this contact should be excluded from work for 14 days and follow what the health authorities are, are advising. The unit should be temporarily closed with the kitchen and general areas, including the locker rooms, restrooms, everything needs to be clean and disinfected, utilizing the EPA-approved disinfect. If you can reopen, do so with staff from other units, if possible, who are not in contact and are not obviously being excluded. Resume normal operations. Normal operations is what we need. We need normalcy. That allays fears and anxiety. We talk about social distancing. In crises like these, we need connection. Connections can be FaceTime, it can be phone calls, it can be all sorts of things just to know that people care about each other. The first people who might be excluded, have someone give them a call, have more than one person give them a call. You, as a manager, give them uh, the ill person or excluded people so they know they are, they're being cared for. Do they need anything? We have ways of delivering food that nobody has to see each other, it gets dropped off on a stoop, et cetera. These are things that we have to have to look at. And of course, we don't have time to get into our healthcare delivery system, but I am hopeful that once we get these um, test kits deployed, there is zero reason that anyone who's in need, whether they're documented, undocumented, have insurance, don't have insurance, everyone needs to be able to be tested or else that will just propagate um, our, uh, our our problem uh, and, and, and make it worse. So um, having said what I have, I think I've given you the thumbnail overview. Um, Rob decided very wisely that um, we would do less slides and more uh, Q&A because I want to know what you're thinking and what you're doing and what you're questioning. Let me start off, and, and as we open up for questions, and say just a, a thank you for taking your time and helping. This is, you know, this this part alone has been very educational um, for me. And, and as we have these discussions, and as things change minute by minute, so a, a great deal of uh, thank you to, to Dr. Kramer for joining in, and and, the, and certainly the EHA team for all that they do uh, to help keep us all safe. So thank you. Um, Tony, do you have any questions to kick this off? I know I always have a question, but I'm never shy. But let's go to the let's go to the polls. Yeah, for those who are on the line, um, you won't be able to verbally ask a question, but there is a Q and A box in your toolbox for Zoom that you can submit a question just by typing it out. I encourage you guys to do that uh, while we're getting kicked off here. 
Um, I think some of the questions that, that have come up uh, for, uh, well, here's one that's come up here already. Uh, I'll pose this question. There seems to be extreme measures taken to close and shut down everything. Is this really necessary or is, or is society overreacting? It's a great question, and I personally believe that it's a little of both. Uh, if we were able to understand the prevalence, what's out there, uh, we probably wouldn't need some extreme measures. I think some of our travel restrictions uh, that were announced the other day, uh, I personally have been calling for them uh, from certain countries, Thailand, Japan. We don't have too many people coming from Iran, but clearly Italy. I mean, I'll tell you, it shouldn't be landing and people coming from Italy. Germany has a tremendous problem. So, you know, now that we're getting into this, um, we're going to see that people are going to be banned from the United States traveling out. You see that um, we're, we're canceling a lot of major events. What's a major event? Well, 250 or more in one venue, which I believe is the California or the Washington standard, and the California standard is 1,000 or more. So everyone has a different um, uh, idea of mass assembly. Uh, churches and synagogues and mosques are, are, are being more remote. Uh, you saw the sports uh, teams that, and leagues that are, 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 uh, are canceling things. But I have to tell you, I think there's a silver lining. When that young player from the Utah Jazz uh, tested positive, he's going to be a poster child. He's young. He's healthy. He hardly knew he was sick. He's going to be better. He's going to be playing. He's going to be fine. And on the older spectrum, Tom Hanks and his wife, um, I think he's 64, um, they are hospitalized. They're doing well. They probably will make a full recovery, and he'll be back making his movie. I think people need to see good outcomes and not hear all of the horrible things. I know in New York they're cleaning the subways, and you know they're the butt of the jokes of, um, of late-night TV. When, when, when were they cleaned last? And I think uh, those of us who do ride subways in New York uh, probably have our own answers, which is probably the uh, first of never. Uh, so uh, we should have sparkling t uh, you know, um, uh, subway stations. But in China, they ran around spraying and fogging with chlorine the streets, all sorts of places. They were able to put up hospitals. So everything that goes on in China isn't really that bad. They've done some really good things, including sequencing the genome of this virus and gave it to the world. The test kit could actually be made. So I just, um, I hope that was uh, responsive to your question. So, uh, Dr. Was... Kramer, we have another question. It's about temperatures. We have heard quite a bit about temperatures. Do we know or think that warmer weather will help eradicate the COVID-19 virus, or does it, or does, or as it does the common influenza or other viruses? In all probability, uh, depending on where we are in a, in the outbreak, uh, when we talk about social distancing now when you're outside and not huddled together like we are in the summer, these upper respiratory viruses usually are knocked down significantly. Uh, and by the way, GI um, goes up in the summertime. Uh, we're hopeful with SARS. It did go away in June slash July. Uh, and one can, can hope that uh, that's the same. Uh, it is, all viruses are sensitive to adverse environmental conditions. When we say it can be on a surface for a longer period of time, in less hospitable environments, such as very warm weather, it's less. So I think there's a wait and see, there's no guarantees, but I think it's reasonable uh, to be hopeful the other piece is, in the southern hemisphere, uh, they don't have the same degree 
of, of problems, but for the fact of traveling. I was looking at the statistics for Australia this morning. Um, they had people from the Diamond Princess. Um, they've had people from Iran. They've had people from Italy. So it's been brought into their country, and the question isn't the number of cases. It's are we getting it into the community for person-to-person -person spread? That's why what we do is we quarantine. And let me give you two definitions. Quarantine is not the same as isolate. When you're in the hospital in negative air pressure, that's isolation. We don't have enough negative air pressure in most hospitals. But when they ask people to self-quarantine, that is just in your own home uh, or, 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 or environment. So, Dr. Kramer, we have another question that's uh, also travel-related. Uh, do you have any guidance for employees on domestic, domestic airline or cross-state travel? Well, I can tell you um, I had one person uh, of my staff. Uh, by the way, my staff is traveling, um, and everyone seems to be okay with it. One person told me going from Seattle to San Francisco there are five people on the airplane. So obviously travel is obviously down. I think if you have risk factors uh, that um, you, have to, you have to do a risk assessment yourself. Um, I am planning on uh, going uh, on a plane in, in a few weeks, um, two planes actually. Uh, and um, again, I think that it's a personal decision. I think corporations have done what they've wanted to do. I've assisted some companies, the biotech companies. Conferences are a little bit different because not, not only the traveling, there's a lot of international people that come to some of these conferences, and the, uh, the, the number of people that congregate um, can, can be pretty dense. So um, I think that you have to look at, um, uh, at your own risk factors and how important the trip is and how comfortable you are, regardless of what it is. And I'm going to tell you this from other studies. The safest seat on, a, on an airplane is the window. Why? Just think of yourself. When you get on a plane, you touch every or every other or every third aisle seat on one side or the other. Nobody touches the window seat. I have never taken a sanitizer to any seat or anything else. If something looks really gross, I will take a, a Purell wipe uh, on the tray table. Um, but, you know, again, uh, sometimes getting immunity is acquired through getting infected, inapparently or by getting sick. So, Dr. Kramer, we have another question that talks about surfaces. It says, we have removed all self-service stations like salad bars and buffet lines from our operations to reduce the number of items customers are touching. Is there a recommendation as to the frequency we should be cleaning high-touch surfaces like beverage coolers, ice machines, et cetera, in order to help reduce this further? Um, firstly, I commend you for uh, removing self-service. I can tell you we have a lot of experience on cruise ships with neurovirus, which, by the way, is hardier than the coronavirus. And um, when that occurs, there's no self-service. We uh, are very, very concerned as well on levers, coffee levers, soda levers, refilling of glasses, refilling of people's plates. Everyone needs a new plate. Everyone needs a new glass. So if you take one of these sanitizers, and again, a sanitizer is only as good and a disinfectant is only as good as the label instructions require. So if it says a one-minute dwell time or a three-minute dwell time, you have to follow that or else you're basically wasting your time and you're not going to get an effective kill. I think that if you were to do this every, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, you know, you, you, that would probably be good enough. There's no guarantee. There's no studies to say 
30 minutes would be good enough or, oh, my gosh, you have to do it every, uh, every five minutes. Um, but I think from a practical standpoint, every 15 minutes you can do it, and that would be fine. Thank you. Here's another question uh, from uh, a good past retired member, Pat. Uh, good to hear from you. It says, I'm now retired after spending 30 plus years on the food service manufacturing side. Now I do marketing for my niece's company, a small bakery and sweets company. This information is very valuable to us, so thank you. The hardest part for us is encouraging our customers to continue to buy our products during this time. Do you know how long this will go on? Small businesses like ourselves just may not survive if it goes on very long. Honestly, I don't have a crystal ball. Well, I actually do. It's pretty cloudy and it's pretty cracked, so it's not very reliable. I think that um, your, the business that you're, you're discussing is at risk. Um, it depends on, on the level we get to. In Italy, you would be mandatorily closed unless you're considered a grocery store. Um, and I don't know how deep they call a bakery versus a grocery store. Um, in New York, where they're canceling the St. Patrick's Day Parade, I believe, uh, you certainly can uh, uh, be open. And uh, whoever comes in, uh, comes in. I'd have some hand sanitizer. Uh, I'd change gloves after each uh, uh, contact very visibly so they see. You might want to put something on your website. You know, we are up to date on this. We are increasing our level of, um, of, of sanitization, of high-touch areas. Make it a PR piece rather than, um, you know, a defensive piece. People like Thank risk you. communication. Thank you. Here's another question. Once someone has contracted the virus and has recovered from it, will they have developed an immunity? Uh, by definition, the answer is yes. There are a couple of people that have allegedly uh, gotten it again. The question is, is it another variant, mutation, or was it a test kit failure? I probably am more on the camp that says maybe it was a test kit failure. Um, but um, this was not a U.S. study. This came out of China. But then again, let's face it, uh, the Chinese have the numbers. We don't. The Koreans have the numbers. We don't. The Italians are assembling numbers. So um, generally, after a viral uh, disease, you do have immunity. The real question is, how long does the immunity last? For neurovirus, for example, it lasts li literally only for a few weeks, and that's one of the disappointing uh, factors with neurovirus. And so here, Dr. Kramer, is another question related to immunity in children. Uh, since they seem to um, have either built this up or don't show signs of sickness, can they be carriers of the virus and pass that to those who are more susceptible? Well, yes, they can uh, pass it on. I mean, um, you know, uh, there's kind of two definitions of carriers, uh, people who have been sick and just keep on shedding. That's one. And the other is people who are what we consider um, uh, they have an inapparent infection. They really don't show signs, but they can pass it, pass it on. Uh, so, yes, children can. And, you know, we get into a lot of questions when you look at multigenerational families, where you see school closures. Uh, all of these things are, are, have to go into the mix of public policy. And I think that many are um, very sensitive to this, and some are a little bit more obtuse to these, to these facts. Um, what happens if you live in a one-bedroom uh, apartment in New York and one person is quarantined and two uh, are not? Well, there's two ways of answering it. One, the person who's infected stays in the bedroom, the others, uh, you know, have to camp out and save a living room. And the other side says they've been together for all this period of time. They're either going to get it 
they are infected. Therefore, you know, as a unit, just 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 um, consider yourselves all 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 infected. So here's another question, just related to the cycle. If COVID-19 gets less aggressive in warmer weather, is it possible to see an uptick in October or November when the weather starts to get cooler again? The answer is, if we do get a uh, a downtick uh, in the summer, uh, we probably uh, we have a chance of seeing an uptick. We did not see that really with SARS, and we're hoping that this follows more the SARS um, uh, modality than our seasonal influenza. But remember, the seasonal influenza, there are different, different uh, bugs every year, and you probably hear the N's and the H's. There's a mixing of N's and H's. Um, so this would probably be, be the same. However, guardedly optimistic, we might be able to start having a vaccine. We were told by the one person who I really believe, Dr. Tony Fauci of the NIH, that it will take a year minimum to a year and a half working since January to get a vaccine. There could be these antivirals, but we have absolutely no, no guarantees of, 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 of anything. But I think that we will be better prepared uh, both for testing uh, and knowing what really has worked and what really has not worked. Terrific. So here's another question. Uh, do you anticipate seeing additional communities being placed under quarantine, such as the situation with New Rochelle, New York? Well, I think that they have a very special uh, circumstance and you know um, they're under quarantine but they're not people are free to m move around but they are being kind of sequestered and isolated um, as a community um, I was pleased to see that the National Guard are running around I believe in SUVs they don't have guns I mean you know come on this is a public health issue this is not uh, uh, you know, uh, a situation that requires, um, you know, uh, uh, the amount of uh, tactical gear that they, they do possess. I think if you can identify in a very, very small area of a mile radius, um, I think it was 120 cases, I think the governor did a good thing by, uh, by, by, by restricting. Although other things are not restricted. I believe there are four or five uh, Metro North stations that go through or uh, New Rochelle. They're, they're going as, as, as usual. Um, I do think that, that you will potentially see it where there is, and I don't want to you know, inject an inflammatory word, a hot zone or a, you know, a, a, an area that has uh, a significant number of cases. So another question for you is, what criteria must be met to, con to consider the greatest risk has passed? Great question. Well, firstly, we don't know what the real risk is right now. That's why I keep on saying we need a prevalence study. We need to understand. We need to understand the numerator, the denominator, and we've got to start counting cases and seeing our epi curve. As it goes up, we expect. South Korea is now at a level, and then when it starts going down, that's when we're going to be able to understand uh, to a level that I'm going to use the word acceptable. You see, with the seasonal influenza, we have enough data to say this is our background community illness that's there all the time. That is not an outbreak. That is nothing that we're very concerned about unless it clusters some weird way. And then when we start seeing more than expected, that's when public health gets more concerned. With this, we don't have a background of community illness. We've had this confounding variable of all sorts of respiratory illnesses. I call it the general you know, seasonal crud, very scientific, but pretty descriptive. And um, again, we're inside, we're close together, uh, and that, 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 that's a risk factor. So um, let's see what 
and you're going to be seeing graphs um, uh, that you're going to be seeing, uh, and I expect five to ten times more within the next week to ten days when we um, really are, uh, have appreciated our testing. And then let's see over the next couple of weeks, are we going up, up, up? Are we going on a level, or are we starting to go down uh, as April, May, and June uh, come? So, Dr. Kirby, that brings to mind this whole testing scenario. Do you have any insight into when tests are going to be more readily available? Uh, do you have any in insight into that? I absolutely do not. I mean, we've been promised uh, from our governmental uh, leadership that they were going to be shipping. Uh, they didn't. I don't know why they didn't. I have to believe it's not for any uh, reason other than they weren't really ready uh, or there was a glitch in something that they are not speaking about. Um, uh, to me, uh, I, I, I would say if we can't get these test kits out within the next uh, week, I think you're going to see a clamor to get the WHO test or the Korean test in here uh, stat. Um, you know, but um, I, I have no idea uh, when we're going to because, as you all know, the um, we've been promised this for greater than 10 days. And uh, one question I received while you were giving that response is whether this this information via the PowerPoint uh, and uh, the recording of this webinar would be available on our website, and we will be making provisions for that. Uh, it will uh, appear on the event page where the uh, webinar was originally uh, advertised for you to register, and we'll also put it under the resource tab of the website. Um, so that will happen in a little bit, probably by the end of today. Um, one other question that I didn't hear asked that I have heard asked around our office is kind of the timeline for the creation of a vaccine. Can you tell us what the typical timeline might be? Well, hopefully we'll be atypical, and it will basically be um, less than a year to less than 6, 18, 18 months. You see, this is a new vaccine. People are going to say, well, we get our flu vaccines, it's the same recipe. It's like you making a cake and putting chocolate chips one day and raisins the next day. It's the same recipe. This is a different recipe. It's a different virus. So we're not 100% sure when. I think that um, with having big pharma on board, uh, as well as the government, as well as the academic, um, uh, and this is worldwide, by the way, we are going to be, um, be put, putting the pedal to the metal. There is one vaccine that is being tested in, in China. Uh, I have no idea if we can say that they're down, um, that their, their epidemic curve, which is going down, um, is in any way, shape, or form that the virus has died out Enough people have gotten it. That's another thing. Enough people have gotten the virus that it keeps on bouncing back and forth, and people are immune. So there's not too many people. It's called herd immunity that you can that, that it can affect, or were any of the a lot of these people did they receive the experimental vaccine, and what what happened uh, with it? Now, I was very pleased that they wanted to put this on the website. Please understand. Most of the information is generalized and should be good. The numbers, they'll change this afternoon, tomorrow morning. So, you know, the shelf life of, of, of some of, of, of this information um, is, is, is not as perfect as usually when we, we do these presentations. Yeah, and we will be noting that on our website that this information is time sensitive. Great, great. And and, and as we close up, and, and first, uh, thank you. But before I do that, I just wanted to ask a question that I think possibly is um, is out there for a couple of people that that may be that may be situational in nature. But I know one of the things for me is I get concerned about not as much my kids, but as the elderly population as you described earlier. 
for those of us that have our parents and, and, and elderly people living in our homes, is there any additional guidance or any care protection or anything that we could be concerned about or should be rewarding or should they be warning their employers and their, and their food operators or anything that they should do to take additional precautions, either in home or with taking that, that issue to work? Um, it's, 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 it's really a black hole. I mean, because number one, we know kids can sometimes transmit without being ill. Adults can too. Um, some of these people are really frail. Others have, um, obstructive lung disease, um, congestive heart failure that puts them at such a higher risk. Um, the only thing that we can say is separate, wash your hands wash your hands, use sanitizer, and do the best uh, that you can. Uh, that's, 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 that's all we can do. This is not the Black Plague of the Middle Ages. It's not the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919. We are going to look at 40, 50 percent of Americans will come in contact with this virus. We think 80 percent will just have very minor symptoms. Some of them will have no symptoms at all. Matter of fact, we are now in spring break, and the joke around is, are these kids going to come back with more than just the regular STDs? I don't know. We'll figure that out. Okay. But, great. Uh, okay. And, and then know, I guess I, the last... I apologize, no, but I think one of the things also is, as, as, as you being the expert and a, and a great deal of thanks, I know that, that I've been using your website and, and your, you have a special link on your website for coronavirus, but are there other things, and, and we will float that amongst the group as well, but are there other sites or anything that you would recommend for sources in the future? Because I know when we were setting this up, you had commentary about how this is just changing every day and as we go along, um, and I found your site very valuable. I um, want to know if you have any, any other recommendations as well. Well, um, yes. The, um, I, I, I personally am uh, glued to the CDC, the WHO, and uh, if you are in a state that the state health department uh, is giving a lot of information, um, that site uh, on their coronavirus page is very helpful. Uh, and uh, there is a um, another uh, link, another um, uh, group that um, uh, I, I, I personally get a lot of information from ProMed, which is out of Harvard. But um, uh, there's a group out of Hopkins that is uh, that puts out uh, daily information. And there, there's another one that they're, um, they seem to be the best. And I believe on our website, we have a link to it on a longer um, uh, PowerPoint that you have to do control and then hit the link. And it gives you both the U.S. and, if I'm correct, it gives both the U.S. as well as um, international um, uh, case numbers as as they're reported in. Great, great. That, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so I would just say I think for everybody that we've done a recording of this that we will be able to play back. We will hold it on the website for uh, until uh, sometime next week because we also want to keep this live and fluid as things change. We want to keep up. Uh, and keep everybody informed. I thank everybody for joining the call, and I especially want to give my personal as well as my professional thanks to Dr. Kramer and the EHA team, um, specifically for taking the time out, and, and uh, none of this would have came out if Dr. Kramer didn't reach out and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help? And it, it's times like that, and I think everybody on this call that knows me and, and knows the mantra that I've had for SHFM, the ESC, is leaning in, and I thank Dr. Kramer and, and certainly his, the full force that he's put behind the EHA team to help all of us. Um, for leaning in. So before we bid everybody uh, fond adieu, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Thank you to all for joining us. Tony, is there anything you'd like before we close the call? No, just look for this information on our website. Like I say, it will be on the event page where you registered as well as under the research, or sorry, the resource tab of our website. Have a great day. Be safe. Be well. 
and wash your hands. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I right. couldn't say it better. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.